So welcome uh, everyone, as always, my name is Samuel Kamochu. I'm happy to take you through the last episode of Analysis and Design. So I'm very, very happy that you guys have taken the time to come and join us. Uh, and I hope that this session will be helpful to you guys. So allow me to share my screen so that I take you through a few things that we need to know. Yeah, so the, this week we are supposed to dive into uh, starting tomorrow in the actual project implementation, the hackathon, where you'll work on a real world problem. And I think some of you uh, are aware that we actually model in a real world problem with a platform that you're creating for bakers. Started with our name, Julisha. After the third episode, we started thinking of changing it to Baked. And I'll share more, more about uh, the product. So one of the key things that I want to repeat and, 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 and just highlight is that uh, you learned how to develop stuff and you learned how to deploy. Those are skills that are very critical but they'll be very helpful if you apply them in the right way. And this is the focus for this week and the focus for the hackathon. So the key idea is that we started with identifying a person who is suffering. And in our case, you have the baker and home bakers, uh, most of the home bakers, they treat it as a side hustle. You had one of the ladies who came last time telling us about, uh, it's not a full-time job. So they have another job but they have this one to supplement uh, their income. So then one of the things that you'll notice is that they don't have the money to implement enterprise systems. So they manage a lot of stuff offline. Uh, so you have a calendar on your phone, you have an invoice tool, you have so many things that are disconnected. So we just want to make uh, their life easier. And you also notice that they keep forgetting. So some of them really appreciated the fact that you can remind them of an order that is coming up next week. And they also appreciated by the fact that we can basically remind them of a birthday or what I would call a sales pipeline in the coming year. So in case they serve you this year with a birthday cake, then next year we can be part of that journey of uh, defining the sales pipeline for them. And maybe if you don't mind, Thomas, you could uh, mute and welcome uh, to this session. Yep. So we have taken risk to share the final details of how we are going to create one of the products. And uh, we were having a conversation earlier and you're saying there is the risk of showing you everything about creating a product that can be actually be used. Uh, but there is also the benefit of showing you. So today M-Pesa code is not open. The designs are not open. If they open them, there are risks. If they open them, there are benefits. So here we are willing to take the risk and take advantage of the benefit of showing you how we would create this solution um, for now. So I'll go back to what we have done. So I said we identified the users. Uh, once we identify the user of the system or the people who have the problem, you remember we had an interview with them. They would tell us a few things and they'll throw words into the mix. They'll talk about, you know, order. They'll talk about the customer. They'll talk about payment. They'll talk about products. They'll talk about pricing, inventory. Those objects are very critical. And for those guys who are doing data modeling, those are the words we pick. Oh, okay. This system should actually have a baker, should have a customer, should have an order, should have something else. Those objects are very critical. Whether you're working with a hospital system, you have to know what hospital, the objects in the in the in that domain. So you look at the problem domain, identify the objects, and model them as much as you can, as close as possible to the real world. So if a if a parent, if a child has a parent, and you know that a parent can have two children in a school, don't try to run away from that natural relationship between those people. So you should create your system in such a way that one parent can have multiple children in the same school and a child can have one or two parents uh, in, the, in, the, in the system of the school. So don't tell us that, you know, you have to create another parent if it's another child and you create a record of the same guy just because your system didn't uh, align itself with the domain or the problem domain. 
So, and that's why, by the way, when you hear for those guys who create APIs and you write the word domain, it basically means you're going into the domain of farmers, you're going into the domain of schools and education, you're going into the domain of bakers. So the domain objects include those things that you create. And that's part of data modeling. Of key interest is what information you have to store. So that one we have learned, and I'll just share what we've been able to identify uh, based on the challenge that we have at hand. And that is what now we'll, we will use now to model our application and to code our application. So what uh, Steve has highlighted was great. Then the other thing that we need to figure out is the experience. I think last, last time we talked about the experience of the system. And here we are talking about when you log in, what do you see? How does the login page look like? How is the experience of signing up? Is a mobile number so critical in this conversation such that notifications, if you capture the number wrongly, then that number, you'll never receive the notifications. So for the bakers, the experience could be you enter the mobile number, but you verify it using an OTP. That's, that's probably an experience question. So you have to ask yourself, what experience do you want to create? And we took you guys through that. The other key thing that allows us now to move to coding is the process modeling. So we looked at the requirements modeling. We have that. Architecture, we looked at the HLDs. LLDs are the inner workings of each of the service. So low-level designs. Now, the HLD says that our service will be made up of a portal, a web app, connecting to an API. The API connects to a DB. And then you continue and you decompose your project as we had agreed. Now, process modeling, LLDs are the internal workings of those mod modules. If those modules are keeping any data, you have to model the data. They are going to keep them, keep that. Then process modeling is also just the finer details of how you're supposed to do, uh, to, 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 to build the system. Now, please note, I don't have to be very exhaustive, and this is an approach that we use for things that are trivial. So in the event I know you can create an order, I don't have to tell you the description of how updating an order need to look, needs, to look, needs to look like unless there is something special in updating the order that is not trivial to most guys. So at the time of process modeling, now you specify, e.g., for example, when an order is created, we need to send a notification to the, to the customer. And we need to do one, two, three, four. So the process of doing that, sometimes we agree as the designers or the architects, and then the developers can implement according to the specification. Why do we do this? Because at the end of the day, writing code, uh, it, the code must be written to conform to something that we want to create. And not the developer needs to be party to that thing only. Many other people need to be party of that conversation, party to that conversation. E.g., the quality assurance guy will verify that the system works according to the specifications that were given and the design considerations that were and the designs that were actually defined for the sake of development. So it's very important for us to define those things. And maybe I could quickly. So at this particular point, I just want to highlight and just to look at the the solution, the, the problem at hand. Uh, which is the baked solution. We look at all those elements together and then we leave you guys to go and study and tomorrow we'll assign you guys challenges and you'll go through the same process. Don't write code this week, hopefully. Next week, you're just supposed to tell us how you have modeled your problem, how you have done your HLDs, the LLDs, process modeling and data modeling. Of course, this process is so heavy when you're building the product from scratch. But then when you're doing maintenance, usual maintenance, things become lighter because you don't have to do the HLD. And I think there was someone who was asking, uh, do you have to, sometimes you have to change something small and it doesn't change the high level architecture or the high level design. So that's something that you need to note. So I'll go straight uh, to, to the challenge at hand and I'll share this URL with you guys. Uh, so that you can look at this at your pace. 
And we have put just one page that has everything, requirement modeling and the design. So one of the key things we said is that we want to create a platform for the bakers, home bakers, to ensure that their business operations are smooth and the smoothness of the operations will facilitate their growth. And this project is being executed as part of this. So if you are asked by someone, what are we trying to solve or what areas are we going to, to look at? We'll deal with customer engagements, the generation of orders, notifications, at the various stages of customer and order management lifecycle, when you create an order and all those things. Then we'll also look at customer experience measurement. I think we talked about a capability where if an order is delivered and Thomas had ordered for a cake, at the end of that order, we could send a survey to uh, Thomas to actually give feedback. And that survey could be uh, online. It doesn't have to be a SMS-based survey, just a link and you come and give your feedback. Now, customer value management, we want these bakers not to miss out on any opportunities. So we, we are going to look at ways in which, and in this release, you might not see all these capabilities at play, but we don't want at, at, at the heart of what you're creating is we want the bakers not to miss out on any repeat business or any new opportunities. So business operations, we want them to have efficient business operations. So when we talked about the solution design, you remember, guys, we talked about you have to consider the platform you're creating and the external actors and systems that fall within the ecosystem. So we have a baker, customer, admin, and maybe I can increase the font a bit just to ensure that you guys can see what we're on. And then we have the payment gateway because one day we'll connect to the payment uh, service providers to ensure that we can collect money or we can initiate online checkout. Then you have SMS gateway because the notifications are a core part of the solution and the email server because notifications still are very important. And then the authentication servers like Google because we don't want people to enter all their details and set their passwords and credentials on our platform. So we have talked about that. So then we said the actors are these guys and the interfacing systems are these. So if you're working on a problem that you'll be assigned, you have to identify whether that solution works in isolation or it has to interface with other uh, systems. So because our system needed to send emails, we needed to have an email server. SMS, same case. If you're dealing with uh, a system as, as complex as uh, maybe a mobile money platform, you have to consider how you'll integrate to the bank systems and all that. Now, functions here, we are talking about baker management, customer management, order management, payment, and authentication authorization. This is what you're going to create in the week. Hopefully in the week, we'll have made some good progress and you're going to get some of you to help us in the implementation. Now, user and characteristics, I'm not going to repeat, but uh, this is something that we had uh, uh, tackled. And then of course, these considerations that we have here. So this section two, one and two, they're part of requirements specification template that we adopted from my triple E. I think you guys saw in our second session um, where we are talking about that. Then external interfaces, we have the web for the users, SMS and email for the users. And then uh, we have hardware interfaces. There are no specific hardware interfaces. Software, we are connecting to SMS gateway. We will use our gateway for now. And we have a notification service that works. So you guys don't have to worry so much about sending of SMS. So we'll help you do that together with email. All servers, we decided to connect to Google for, for this uh, project. So when you're signing up, you can sign up with your Google account. Or signing in, you can sign in with your Google account. So we're just making the work easier for the young guys uh, and the bakers who will be working with that. Now, functional requirements. So here, this is where we come and break down the various requirements as, as far the, the various requirements that we have within the system. So you will come and break down. And it's very important that you break them down into a granular format that can be worked on by a guy one at a time. So in authentication, we'll have the sign up page, the sign up using Google, sign up using the key, the local details, you enter your details, sign in using the local credentials and sign in using the Google. 
Of course, if you are signing in using your email address and all those details, you have to set or activate the password or set the password. So that's part of the customer journey that we expect you guys to create within your system. Then authorization will have two roles, admin role and baker role. And uh, the customer does not need to log into the system. So they'll not have any authority over the system. So authentication is knowing you are who you are or identifying that this is actually Alvin. Authorization is identifying this is Alvin, but Alvin is allowed to be an admin within the system or Alvin is allowed to be a baker within the system. Now, Baker management will have sign up Baker, as we mentioned above there, and all these details are here. You can suspend a Baker if they disappoint you because this platform at some point we want to commercialize it. So if they don't pay, they can be suspended or if they, they become fraudulent, they can be suspended. And you can close a Baker if you want to finish uh, interacting with them. You can set the pay Baker payment details, profile logo, notification settings and notification templates. So these are things that you need to know. In terms of customer management, you can create a customer, suspend, activate or unsuspend, close again if you don't want to deal with that customer again. And then you can also update customer details and you can view the customer. So those are functions that the system should provide a way to do. Um, then order management, you can create an order, you can update an order without changing the amount. Because if you want to change, you can update an order without changing the paid amount, sorry. You can con confirm an order, you can cancel an order, you can mark an order as delivered, you can delete an order, or you can view an order. These are things a baker can do. And finally, when they want to record payments against an order, they can record a payment. And if you overpay, you can do negative adjustment and correct and give a narration and say, I recorded a thousand, ten thousand instead of a thousand. The guy said, had paid a thousand. So you do an adjustment of negative nine thousand. And then you have view payment, you'll be able to view that. Now there are other features that will come in the future that I don't want to focus on, but sometimes it's always good to look at the features that come in the future so that you can design your system with some of these things in mind. But for now we are not focusing on the future features. You'll be able to look at that. So you also have non-functional requirements which are provided like data archival and deletion of data. If a customer is closed, you need to get off, get the customer off the system and there are orders that they had created, you also remove them nicely. So you have to generate logs to ensure you can measure the experience on the web app. So some of these things will look at them and see how we can achieve them. And then orders and payment numbers, we are not going to use ID auto increment. So the system should generate an order number because if you know an order one, you can always try to call order two on the API. And luckily or unfortunately, you might be able to hit an order that exists. So you don't want to share details so that people, ah, this system has only processed five orders since they launched. So you don't want that information to be known by the people. So you have to create an algorithm to generate order numbers that probably do not tell so much about the system. Now, we did HLD. And if you have any questions, you have to come and ask. Uh, we did HLD, which we looked at. And some of you might come and tell us, we said we'll have a web app, which will be Angular, Spring Boot API, and then you have the payment service that will connect to the payment gateway, notification service that will connect to the two notification service providers, and the batch that will keep checking in the DB every day to see who needs to be reminded and schedule the reminders through the notification service. And then finally, you have the Google server and the API service can invoke the Google server directly to actually log you in using Google. So some of you might argue, and some of you who have watched a lot of videos on microservices, you could decide one day to say that this thing doesn't comply to the microservice architecture. Yes, there is a lot of monolithic design in this, especially now that all APIs are in one project. And the reason for that is microservices, microservice architecture uh, is suited for organizations that have a lot of people and you want to have independence in those teams. But guess what? For our project, we don't have teams. We just have one team. So let them work on this and we'll consider performance and scaling considerations. And if one day, 
we see that the project is becoming bigger and you need to deal with maybe order management is a module on its own or a service on its own, we'll just come and separate it and put the APIs there, then you put the API gateway and all those things that you need to have within your microservice architecture, and we can do that. So don't worry, we are going to use this because uh, we don't need to break our service into so many small services that will make the implementation very costly in terms of time and effort. So the web app will do what it will do. So everything is given here. So you need to know what API a service is supposed to expose and what API it will consume. And all these APIs, they are all aimed at ensuring that we achieve a functional requirement. And of course, even the non-functional requirements. The notification service, you go read. Its work is to connect, maintain connections to the SMS gateway and the email server and expose a REST API that you can use to send an SMS. So for you, you'll be given a thing, a JSON request. You push it to an endpoint. The guy takes care of converting that JSON message into what the telcos or the SMS gateways expect. So that's the work of that, the payment service and the batch service, and now we go to the data model. So I don't know whether there is anyone with a question there because today my focus is just a brief view of the data modeling. And then we will also look at the process modeling and we end there and we now start thinking of how we can have teams that will execute this project. So in the event you have a question, please ask. In the event you have a question, please ask. Uh, and Marlin will also share this link on the group after this so that people can dive into them. And you can use it as a reference. It doesn't mean that this is the gospel truth of modeling a problem, but we are just sharing something that we believe can work. So there are many other ideas you can get from various circles, but the key idea here is just to share something. Okay, so I can proceed. So let's look at data modeling. So uh, as part of the design of this system, delete requests are normally very heavy on the DB. And we like deleting during the off-peak hours. And also in this age of data, uh, you don't delete data, you just archive it. <laughs> so, so we are designing our systems to do that, not to scare the bakers, but in the event you need to go back to history and recover something, then you can archive it. Of course, this is with respect to all the data protection policies that are being enforced and created in this country. But that's one of the things that we do. We also ensure that our data model must have fields that allow us to audit. So in every object we'll have when it was created and who created it, last updated and who updated it and the constant status by default all objects will be active unless they are deleted so if you delete an object that's the end of it you'll not see it from the portal but it's actually somewhere in the back end and it will be archived using the background process so this is part of the data modeling so if i talk about an object like a customer so i'll say a customer has a name xyz plus they also have these fields so that's why we put there so that we can do the data modeling. Now the user object, uh, I had done it with something in mind, but I know that the user has all those details about the user, but they also have the registration mode, whether they registered through local or they registered through Google based on what that you mentioned. So we'll allow the developers to model the user tables and all that, and we'll support you guys in the process. So these objects are not, user object is not a main domain object, but it is a supporting object that you cannot avoid because people have to log in into the system. So allow me to look at the user baker, then I can share a few things. So a baker will have an ID and maybe at this point, I'll tell Barongo and team, when you're doing modeling, don't try to mix data modeling and, and process and system integrations. So when you're told to create the data model, you're just creating the data that you're going to store, not how it is inserted, not how that data. So th there you discuss when you're talking about process modeling and the experience modeling. So in your, if for those of you who have done database designs, you know entity relationship diagram, which you still learn in school. 
that's part of the data modeling. At that particular point, we don't highlight, we don't have arrows going to, to another system. Like you don't have a node server in a data model. So you have a student and parent and class units, marks, all those are the objects you see in a school system and the relationship that they have. If a student can take three units, then the relationship between a student and units is, is one to many or many to one, depending on how you look at it. So here we are talking of a baker. The baker will have the full names. You can decide to separate first name, second name, and middle name, first name, last name, and middle names. It's okay, although there is nothing like names. Even if you have a thousand names, uh, you still have, you, you still say my name is. So, but sometimes in the model you find us using names uh, wrongly, but uh, just to show that you're including many names. So we have the mobile number, which I call MSSDN because I come from the telco space. So we don't call them, we call it the MSSDN is the unique number. Email address is something that a baker must have. Location info. So this one is uh, more Kenyan, Barongo. So it's the country, the region or the county, uh, the town and the physical address. So don't tell us postal code, don't tell us uh, uh, street number. We are still in Kenya. Maybe that one will bring it in 2050 when we get organized. And then latitude and longitude, sorry, this is typo for that. Now, this information is critical because at some point we want to ensure that we help the bakers uh, be visible. So if you're looking for a baker in Nakuru, you can actually go and find the baker in Nakuru. So this is capability for the future. We are modeling for the future. But during the registration, we'll enter that, all these details, and then later we will come and uh, add that. Now, the status is you can have an, you can be new when you are created, when you activate your account, then you become active. When you don't pay or when the admin decides to suspend you, you become suspended. And when you decide to close your account or the admin decides to close your account, then you become closed. Now, the reason is the status reason. If you suspend someone, you leave a small reason there, a narration to tell us what will happen. So also for the baker, and this is me modeling. So we have the payment details. So the idea is this as part of the journey when you create an order as a baker, the SMS that goes out goes out with the details of your payment. So you can specify how people will pay you, maybe buy goods, pay bills, send money, pochi, and bank in the future. And if you say buy goods, then you provide the till number. If you pay pay bill, you provide the till number. Although sometimes some of you know that till numbers are for buy goods, but it's the same number. And then if you can, if you say send money, then you provide the mobile number. If you say Pochila Biashara, then you provide the number that you're going to be paid again. Please note that the number you have for your contact could be different from the number that you receive payments through. And then you have the till number, uh, the account number. So for pay bill, you might need to have the account number. E.g., maybe the baker has an account with uh, COP, uh, with KCB. So they are using 522522, 522, then they put the till number. Or someone is using the one till capability for equity bank 247247, 247, then the account number. So that is a uh, thing that you can have. And this is what you're going to use to send SMSs. Then still under payment details, there is a setting that we need to have that will allow us to specify how much is the deposit that you need to put in the system. So if let's say, for example, the order is 1,500 Kenya shillings, the baker might decide to say that you must pay 50%. So you must pay at least 750% for the order to be automatically confirmed once the payment is recorded. So these are things that will allow us to give a very good experience to the baker because the orders will be confirmed every time the person has made a payment. So, or they can decide to confirm manually. So baker settings, one of the key things is once you give feedback, remember we have a page where we'll give feedback. We want to brand it in the baker's uh, brand. So you can have the logo of the baker, then you can have other things like notification settings. So when a customer uh, wants to be notified, do we notify them using SMS or email or both 
or none. So a baker can go and say, for my orders, my customers should never be notified. So you can have such a setting. And of course, when our order is created, we'll come and check this setting to determine what kind of message you need to send to the customer. Now at that particular point, I'm speaking of the process. So when an order is created, there is another process we have to follow that has to check the notification settings and then determine what message to send out. If you're sending an SMS, what's the display name? Maybe KCAD or BIT. If it's email, then what's the name that you see on the email address? Because every email has a description. You can have the email, but you can have your name on as the display name. So then you have notification templates. So the message that goes out that tells you, thank you for the order. Uh, you can make a payment. The total amount is 1500 Then you can make a payment of this, 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 this. These templates are defined within the system so that one baker can change the message format accordingly. So that's the consideration that we had. And these templates can be the various stages of order. When a new order is created, what message do we send? When a partial payment is made, what message do we send? Of course, the partial payment will have to send the details of the remaining balance and then full payment, then cancel order, deliver order. All these things are things that we can templates that we can define. So whoever is creating the database must have a way of setting these settings for the data. So I've not given how you're supposed to do this on the DB, but this gives you something that is important. As part of the design, especially when you have an order object, uh, a custom object, sorry, that has various statuses, then we need to be able to have the status, the state transition diagram, or sometimes called the, the state machine or finite state machine. So this is something that you have to have. And the key idea that you need to know is that when an order is new, it can be closed. When an order is new, it can be taken to active. Uh, sorry, not an order, this is a customer. When a customer is registered, they get into new. Once they activate, they can get to, uh, uh, once they activate, they go to active. And when they're active, they can be suspended. And a suspended guy can be taken back to active. An active guy can go back to suspended. But then once an active guy is closed, that's the end of it. A suspended guy can also be closed, and that's the end of it. So this is something that we have to know that will allow us to define how the system works. It's still part of the design process. And I'd allow people to just give ask any question on the chat regarding this for about 60 seconds. Excuse me. Yes, yes. Yeah, on Ask. the diagram uh, between the state of active and suspended, what do you mean when you say manual or non-payment? So it means that uh, you can be active and without anyone doing anything, you can get to suspended. So as part of the business process, what we'll say is that, remember we are bringing a capability where a baker needs to pay maybe a hundred shillings yeah. per month, right? Are we together up to there? Yes. So what if they don't pay? What happens? Okay, okay. So they get the, suspended. The system will suspend. So there is a job that will be checking every month to see. So you as the developer, you'll have to define another service that keeps the life cycle, checks the life cycle over of a customer. It, it, this is a, a good example. When you think of a bank account and you don't transact for a certain period of time, the account becomes dormant, right? Yes. So it's, but who changes the account to dormant? Is it a human or is it the system that does that automatically? The system automatically. Thank you. So it's the same case here. So when you see manual, it means on the web portal, you can go and find suspend. Anywhere you see manual, you can do it from the web portal manually. Anywhere you find maybe or something else, then it means that event of non-payment or that action of not paying can actually lead to your suspension. And anywhere you find suspended, if you make a payment, the system should unsuspend you automatically. Are you getting the point? Yes, yes, thank you. Okay. So that's, that's, thank you very much. Uh, I'm assuming that, who was that? Omosembi, thank you for that. So this is uh, one way to, to just model. Now let's look at the customer. 
So the customer will have maybe ID, and this is very opinionated because we are thinking in relational databases. I know some of you might be thinking of NoSQL and all that. So we just just bear with us, but you can still do the same modeling without uh, thinking of uh, the type of database that you're going to use. So a customer would have a name. Uh, you can decide to do first name, middle name, or, or surname. Then you have the type, individual and corporate. Who are we modeling with this in mind? Because sometimes, and I know we've talked to some bakers and they have told us that sometimes they have an engagement with a company. Like Kekiad, the example, the, 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 the typical baker that you're using, for example, has a relationship with Meliora. They supply all our birthday cakes to all our staff members. So that particular point, Kekiad will create Meliora as a corporate customer. And that could influence a few things in terms of the experience. So we have not said what, but we know as we go into the future, this is a thing that you have to consider. So you have the mobile number, the person who will be receiving the, the messages, email address, physical address, uh, payment mode. And this again, we are thinking of the corporate individual. Most corporates, you don't pay they don't prepay. So cake here delivers the cake to you, to, to the staff member. Then later they send an invoice and they could even send invoices for the whole month and then they get paid. So in that particular case, the order can be created as confirmed. Now, when I speak about that now, we are thinking of the process model where we are saying that when an order is created, if the type of, or if the payment mode is post pay, then set the status to active automatically. Oh, sorry, con to set, sorry, what did they say? Yeah, sorry, Th this is the order processing flow. So when you're creating an order for this customer, the order can be created either in a new state, and let me just jump a bit here, in new state or in confirmed state, it, depending on the payment mode. If the payment mode is post pay, then you don't have to wait for confirmation. So you create the order, and you mark it as confirmed. But if it's prepaid, the order is created in new state until the deposit is paid and the order moves into uh, basically post pay. Uh, the order moved to confirmed state. Then again, for the customer, please note, this is a field that is very critical in order management. And this is a field that is also very critical in order management. So the status, uh, if you have any question, you can ask. So you can suspend a customer. You can suspend, uh, you can close a customer in case you don't want to interact with them in future. And a customer when created, they'll be active. So when I say manual, it means that a customer, the system will never ever change the status of the customer. That's what this diagram means, that the life cycle of a customer is when you create them, they are active unless you close them unless you suspend them. And this work is done by the baker because the baker is the one who created the custom. Any question? So maybe I can proceed now to the order, which will be maybe the second last thing that we need to consider. So you have the order number, the name uh, of the order. So if it's the customer who created the order, uh, you just have to attach, assign that order to the customer. I think there is a foreign key here and also the baker ID for performance reasons, those guys who do databases, I'm sure you are warned against. Uh, uh, if you have a customer ID, the customer ID is attached. The customer is attached to a baker. So with the, the customer, you can resolve the baker ID. But in this particular case, we are adding it here to ensure that we don't have to do a lot of referential checks whenever we want to retrieve some data on our APIs. So the order will have the name of the order, maybe Sam's birthday cake and then the type of the order. This thing will be very beneficial when you're coming, we are talking about the anniversary uh, reminders. Next year, birthday, we have to remind the baker to, to do that or create what you're calling the sales pipeline. So the details of the cake at this particular point. So we are not selecting, you know, you need a red velvet cake and three cupcakes. No, no, no. All those details will be put together in one uh, uh, field, which is details. And then later, as we go into the future, we will add now things like products, as you have noted in the roadmap. So we have notes, special notes to be displayed 
uh, in case that order has a special note that the baker should not forget. E.g., this guy does not do milk. So at that particular time, not at that particular time of placing the order, you cannot, uh, you'll have to tell the baker not to put milk in the order because this guy has a, a condition that uh, does not allow him to take milk. Then the order amount is what you ordered, and then the amount paid is the accumulative amount that has been paid. The order amount, amount is set by the user, while the amount paid is set by the payment process. So anytime you say pay, then we come and update this figure. Anytime you say negative adjustment, then we come and update this figure. So the date when the order was made and the date when the order was uh, delivered. Now, some of you might be asking, why are we having order date and created on or created at date? It's because when we launch the system, because of the capabilities we have, some, some of these guys might want to backdate and enter data that is historical for the sake of reminders going forward. So it's important for us to allow the user to be able to set the order date in the event they create an order uh, that was meant to be processed in the past and mark it as delivered. Uh, so they can do that historical data. So we we'll use those fields for that. Then delivery date and deliver that. Then, of course, you have the status for the order. This is the main object of the system because the bakers are trying to manage orders on our platform. So we have the confirmed, canceled, delivered, and deleted, and the reason for the status. So if you cancel, then you have to give maybe a reason for the baker to remember, ah, okay, this guy canceled the order because of this reason. Then you have the delivery address, which could be different from the delivery address or the physical address of the customer, e.g. for corporate customers. So it's good that you borrow from the customer, but in case of corporates, you might have a staff member who is in Akuru, and of course the company is in Nairobi. So at that particular point, you might need to have a field that indicates where will the cake be delivered. Then the other thing is attachments. Uh, in case you want to do a birthday cake for your one-year-old or two-year-old baby, and they just want uh, uh, those those funny, uh, um, uh, they, they just have an image of a cake that they want you to deliver. So at that particular point, we can have the attachment as an object. In the DB, my suggestion is we store it as a blog because of uh, you know our ease of deployment. So we keep those images in a DB somewhere. We hope that they're not going to be big. And the key idea is to ensure that you don't have to deal with the file system. So maybe someone could change that and you save it on a, on a shared file system or even those buckets that we, we learn where you can store the data. So the customer ID and the baker ID becomes very critical. And then the order state transition now allows us to say that an order will be created as new. It can go to confirmed manually or through payment or maybe even automatically for guys who are on post pay. And then a new order can actually be canceled and a new order can actually be deleted. Now, once the order has been confirmed, you can cancel it. You can deliver it or you can mark it as delivered when you deliver the order to the cake to the customer and then you can actually delete it where necessary although i'm questioning whether we can delete an order that is already confirmed because maybe some payments have already been done so it's something that you have to think through but that's the transition diagram that has been created by the designers based on what the bakers would want so you're not the one who creates this thing and lastly, we'll look at the, the payment. So when you're dealing with payments, please note that we are dealing with manual payments. We are not integrating to a payment gateway in the first sprint. So all you need to do is the user will enter the payment, will give the payment ref number, external payment ref number, the mode of payment. In this case, it will be manual, but then later it will become and give us auto, automatic payments when we integrate to a payment processing service in a later stage. How much was paid? Again, is that order and the balance after the order. Now, the other thing that you need to note is that for every payment, a payment is made against an order and bad practice again, but good for performance. You will also have to specify the customer ID 
and the big ID to help us retrieve payments based on, on an API. We filter by these things without having to hit other tables. So it will be a foreign key referencing the baker.id and pay that when the payment was actually recorded on the system. So that's it. Ah, finally, I thought payment was the last one. Actually, we have the last one, 7.5. Uh, this is an error, and this is basically the notification. So we will store the notifications on the system because part of the commercial engagement that we want to have with the baker is to ensure that they pay for the messages that go out. So we need to keep track of every message that is generated by the system. So the notification can either be an SMS, email, subject applies to email, from to uh, content, uh, it has to be a large field to accommodate email content. At this particular point, we are not doing attachments. That will come and we'll change it later. Send at, the send status, the send reason, and then deliver that, and then the delivery status, and how many units of messages were consumed. And this is applicable for SMS. And of course, if there is a cost, we have the cost. Then we say that the SMS was against a certain big ID, against a customer ID, and against a certain order, and against a certain payment. These things can be none. In the event the order is created, the order ID will be there, but the payment ID will be none. So that's what we define as part of the model. So I don't know whether there is anyone with a question, but essentially that's how we think in terms of the modeling of the systems, modeling of the systems. And I'm hoping that you guys can actually uh, think in those lines. So if you're dealing with a farmer's uh, platform, you have to think in terms of the farmer, the, whatever they are bringing, the produce, or maybe something. And you have to think of the fields that will help you achieve the journey and the experience that you want. So I don't know whether there is anyone with a question so far. Um, uh, I have this question. Yes, in, in, almost. In this in this particular system, who creates the customer? Who creates the customer? Thank you so much. Yeah. The customer is created by the baker. Why did you ask that? Uh, because I thought maybe because it's an online system. Now, mm -hmm. if I want the cake, I could go search the system and register myself and then look for the baker as well. And Thank you so one. much. Thank you so much, Amos, because it, it appears like both of us are on the same page. That's a question that we have asked ourselves. But in the initial phase, customers are not going to register themselves. So we are creating it as a, let me, and, and, and sorry to share these uh, too many details about this thing. I hope Dan will not be against me or complain about what I'm sharing here. But you have to think, because we are becoming problem solvers, we also have to ensure that we go um, we, we don't swim against the current. So we have to swim with the current. From a strategic perspective, don't start with a portal where people can buy cakes. It, won't, it may not work. It can work, but it, it, it won't work. When you're creating platforms, you have to identify who is coming and what pain are they coming uh, to solve. So the person who is in pain is not a customer. You, you have no issues ordering a cake today. If you need a cake, you can actually ask a few friends. Do you know a guy who can provide a cake? And they'll tell you. So your pain is not painful. <laughs> it's, it's not a big pain. So we don't start with a customer. And you can go watch videos on how platforms are created. You have to bring a guy first who has a problem. In this case, is our baker. And the baker comes on board and we give them a system to use for their day-to-day -day operations and efficiencies. Now, then the next stage where we actually come and realize that we have bakers from the whole country, 47 counties. Kakamega, there is a baker. In, in Moranga, there is a baker. You go to, to, to this place where they do rice, moya, and there is a baker. Nakuru, there is a baker. Riru, a baker. And all these bakers are busy using the system for their efficiencies. Now, the next thing is now when we open up the platform now too and say we can have the bakers directory. And at that point, we'll have ensured that we create products also so that now we can bring the guy who will now come and complement our ecosystem. 
So I know we started with a very simple idea and I know some of you by now can start seeing how this business could be very, very profitable in the future. Because what happens is that those bakers, when they're on the system and you have 3,000 bakers, in other words, you can help guys who are looking for bakers. At that point, they'll register and the customer will be detached from the baker. But not now. Because you don't have reasons to come and register yourself at this phase of the project. True, Amos? True, true, true. I've seen the sense. Yes. So you have, we, we are the problem solvers and we are the strategists also. So I, I hope you can, you've seen the strategy. Don't, it's like the way you're told carrot and, is it carrot and stick? Yeah. So you, you have to figure out which comes first. We can't go that way, but you have really thought in the lines that we have thought, but that will come in a later stage. So, but we have to do the first release. We take it to the bakers. The bakers love it. We get 10,000 bakers. And once you have 10,000 bakers and the, you know, the way uh, some of you have the hope is coming. Oh, you know, it was sorry, that one was freedom. But after, <laughs> after that, now we have hope because with those 1,000 bakers, it means that you, even though you could be in Nairobi, you can actually send a cake to your mom from the neighborhood, which will basically be a very good thing. Yeah, because I know you guys want to spread the love. So that's it regarding that. And I hope you guys can see. So the key idea is now to model this data, store this data. So the guys who are going to create those objects on the Spring Boot projects, you will create a payment object that will have these attributes. Are we together? Yes, yes. Yes. So, so, so we do not. And, and now you guys can see, once you define this, and it's a thought process. I know some of you, I gave you the challenge. You didn't think like this. It takes a bit of experience, but we are doing it so that the next one that you'll do, whether it's your own idea, you'll do it in a nice way. And we can show you that within a very short time, you can actually create a product through collaboration. So if we sp split ourselves and ask Gianina to do the payment APIs, and we ask uh, Alvin to do the order APIs, and we ask someone like uh, Mufadili to do something else, then at the end of the day, we'll have a system that has been created by many people that is working towards uh, building a solution for a real baker who we had and we met. Now, that talks about the process, the, the data modeling. At least now we've spoken into the data modeling space. When you guys are in school, you study that you have to normalize your databases. Let me tell you one thing. For performance reasons, we have found ourselves denormalizing databases, especially putting data that is repeated into another table to avoid hitting another table when you are reading something. So that's those scenarios do happen, but at the end of the day, we will show, we will tell you where we feel you need to disrespect at the risk of having another challenge. But at the end of the disrespect, the rules of normalization at the risk of introducing another challenge, but gaining another benefit that could be bigger than the challenge that you might be introducing. So it's a trade-off. Now, experience modeling, that one we already talked about. And we said that when bakers log in, this thing is supposed to be mobile friendly. So the baker, when the baker logs in, what would they want to do? They are either going there to place an order. That's what they'll do probably on a day-to-day -day basis or to see an order that is pending or to do to create a new customer and place a new order. So that's why we modeled our system to, let me just minimize a bit so that, because I know we had done this. This is the screens that we did, but I just enriched them a bit. If you're doing mobile friendly, you might have to hide a few of the fields. Maybe you'll have the order number, the name, and the due date, and then the button to view, if you're doing on mobile. So the key thing is when they come in, they'll be searching for the customer, and it will autocomplete, as we said last time, Steve Musembi and Steve Wakungu, the moment you type Steve, you start seeing the customers that are listed there through the API, which we define. So I'm not going to repeat this because we talked about it, and this is what we are giving to the developers to implement. For a customer, if you search a customer, and you see Steve, the drop down there, as you type, you can see names being suggested. 
The moment you select Steve Mosambi, will be taken to this place. And instead of John Doe, we'll have Steve Mosambi, the customer ID, and actions. Those actions here will be either suspend, close, or activate, depending on the status that is here. This is where now the state transition diagrams comes into play. If the customer is active, they can only be suspended or closed. If the customer status is suspended, then they can only be reactivated or unsuspended, or you can close based on the state diagram. So it's for the guys who are, you know, NG if those guys who are there with Wesley talking about Angular. If this condition is met, hide this. NG show if this condition is, NG hide if this condition. So in your HTML, you'll have all of them active, but you'll come and say for the tag that has close, you'll say NG hide or NG show, or hide when the, the Nini is, 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 is active. You hide activate if the customer is already active. You hide suspend if the customer is already suspended. You hide close or when it is closed, you don't show anything. You can't do anything on a closed account according to the business requirements. So here we talked about this and the APIs that you're going to have. So we talked about the model objects we've discussed just above there. We need an API to filter by this. So the guys who are doing Spring Boot, you'll have an easy time because uh, Gideon and the team took you through that. Now, if you're viewing an order, now, so when you're viewing the customer, you also want to view the orders that they have made with the most recent at the top, and then the payments and also the notifications that have been generated against that order. So if you go to the notifications table, you select where the Baker ID is this, and the order ID is this, and maybe where the customer ID is this. And then you come in, get all those notifications, and you display them there. So these are tabs, and this is the active tab. If you click payments, it takes you there. Notification takes you there. If you want to add a new order for this John Doe, you come and create the order from here. Then it gives you a dialogue that will come up. And this is now to the designer of these guys. Uh, this is work that we have left for you guys to work on. Then you have order view experience. If you want to view an order, Sorry, did I just, oh, this is customer view and the orders they have made. Now, if you click the view, it takes you to the order view. The order view looks like this. And you have the order number, you have the name, you have the customer name so that you can go back to John Doe if you want to click it. The type is a birthday cake. The order date is this. Delivery date should be 1st of November. And then status is confirmed. Amount paid. Amount is 1,500. The paid amount is 1,000, which goes past the threshold maybe of 50%. So that the order now is automatically confirmed. And then if you say, uh, we can have status here more, three dots. When you hover on it or you click on it, you can see the reason for the status. That's my suggestion, experience design. And then you come here and delivery address, just Kaflats, house number 17. Uh, this is for the sake of our sister Barongo who does not uh, want to use postal codes. Yeah, then we have delivered that. Uh, in case the order is delivered, at this particular point, it's not. But when it's delivered, then deliver that date will be populated. You can make a payment on the order. Please, this is one page, two sections of the same page. Here there is uh, paginations. If you want to see the images or the image of the cake that you need to create, uh, if it's a custom cake, then the attachments could be the images of the cake. And then you come here and create that. Now, if you're clicking when you're here, you'll be able to see the payments made on that order. Like in our case of 1500, we can see that there was a payment of 1000. If you make another payment of 500, this one will be paid is 1500, and the amount paid is 1500, and the amount is 1500. So the order is fully paid. And at this particular point, we expect to see the two payments here with the most recent at the top. So the 1000 at the bottom, and then the 500 at the top because it's the most recent. Now, if you click here, it shows a pop-up, display pop-up dialog, and that pop-up dialog looks like this. So it tells you that it was a manual payment of a thousand shillings, this, 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 and then you close. So that's a dialog that you see on the user. And if you want to view all orders, because there is a place here where we said you can view all orders. Uh, when you come here to the homepage, view all the orders that are there, it takes you to this page. So the key idea here is not to focus on experience design because we discussed it in the last section. I just want now to briefly talk about the last part. 
sorry, before I talk about the last part, there is now change order status. The moment you say suspend an order or suspend a customer, sorry, confirm an order or suspend a customer, you'll be given the name of the customer and you give a narration for suspension. This guy does not pay, so I'm suspending them. And then anytime anyone comes and logs into that account and looks at that customer, they'll see the status is suspended and the, the status is suspended. And the reason is because they are not paying for the orders. So that's it. And uh, you can come and do create customer experience. The dialogue you'll have create order experience, create or order payment or record order payment, view notification, dialogue, sign up, sign in. Baker settings view, Baker settings logo, where the logo will be if you want to change, under settings, notification settings, under settings, payments, under settings, location info. So those are things that the user of, or the Baker in this case can change. And I want to stop there a bit and ask you guys whether there is any question that you'd like to ask regarding creation of those ad system. Now, Sometimes you guys are, uh, and, and, and as you're asking the question, there was a time we were doing a system, uh, we were doing a demo last week of a system that's created by these guys here. Now, when you look at these menus, everything that you see there, even settings, if you go to settings or you go here to maybe applications and you discover that there are all these applications that you have, these are monitoring tools that was created by the guys. Akina Wesley and team. So these guys had to follow the same thought process. So they say, if I want to come and have a dashboard and I want to change the way this dashboard looks like, and this is how the dialogue looks like. So I can come here and say, I want to add maybe transaction for this, you see? And this is what we call the experience. And this is created by Kenyans like you. And these are graphs that are created by guys. The coding part is the very little part of it. The experience is the greatest. If you give people the greatest experience, then they can actually be very happy. So you can switch from one dashboard to the other. You can come and monitor one service to the other, and you can do all those things. So I'm just showing this just to tell you that with the right experience in mind, then you can come and bring many developers to work on these parts at different stages. And that's why we are talking about collaboration. So if you are creating a solution by yourself, there is a big risk that you don't think about these things beforehand. And if you do not do so, then you don't create a product. You run at a risk of not creating something that works, that can be maintained, and that can live beyond you. So questions, anyone with a question, you can ask so that we proceed. Well, now let me go and finalize on the process modeling. Now, process modeling, how we do it in our own organization, it's basically where you need to specify how the developer must implement that logic. E.g., I can tell you that M-PESA transaction numbers are numeric numbers, and this is, I'm not sharing information that is out there, but this is, they are numeric numbers, but they are converted into, you know, the way you have hexadecimal that starts with 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Then you say A, B, C, D, E, F. That's hexadecimal. So you have a, a number in the base 16. Now, for M-Pesa, you know that they can go A to Z and numbers. So maybe that's A to Z is 26 characters and 0 to 9, those are 9. So together they are. 36 characters. So they represent that numeric number to base 36. What happens is that 10 digits in decimal can actually be compressed into very few symbols in base 36. And you can go try that on your own. And of course, when you see that number, a human, by the time you see O7MZA, you can't even tell the difference between two numbers that are adjacent to each other. And that helps us deal with not dealing with a huge number as a transaction number. And also it hides information to the ordinary user of how many transactions we process per day. Because it's possible for you to wake up in the morning and check the first number <laughs> and the last transaction number for, from M-Pesa. And using the two, you can say, ah, M-Pesa processes 10,000 transactions a day. If you want to hide that information from the public, uh, you can just hide that by generating those numbers. 
at that particular point, we will specify that the logic of generating the transaction number must follow these rules. And that's the part of how the process modeling. So we will say that uh, like the experience, sorry, allow me to skip the authentication process and how that process will work, but I'll talk about the Baker creation and the registration process. One of the things that you have said is that a Baker can register manually or using Google sign up. So you, of course, if they use Google sign up, the data is collected from Google. If they use manually, they have to type in the details. Now, one of the things that you need to note is that if they do type of the type in the details as part of the process, you might have to validate the mobile number using an OTP so that someone doesn't enter a number that doesn't belong to them. Now, we will also set the default notification templates. So if when an order is created, instead of telling the baker to configure templates, we can decide and say, we'll set the order. A new order has been created. Uh, the amount is this, the payment details are this. We can define those templates automatically. And then once that is done, we'll come and create a baker when you're creating the baker and we'll create the user on the user table and we assign that baker to the user or we assign the, we attach that user to the baker. Maybe that's a better one. And then we come and ask if the registration mode is Google, then you set the account active. Else you send the activation email so that when someone sets their password, the account becomes active. So there I'm telling the process flow. Of course, I'm describing the standard. I could have avoided this and allow you to follow the standard process for authentication when you're dealing with, uh, for creation of bakers when you're dealing with, you know, Google and all that. But since I didn't want to take the risk of not telling the developers how it should work, then you specify it. Whatever is too trivial, don't say it. We are not here to tell you that adding a user, you insert this into this DB and you do one, two, three, no. We don't need to do trivial things, but things that are not trivial, please ensure that you define them as a team before you develop. Of course, you're not doing this to say that I am the one defining this process so that another person develops. No, I'm defining it so that the other team members can review it. I could be the one developing it or the other person could be developing it. But by the time we are done, the QA or the quality assurance guy who will be verifying that the system works according to the specifications will be following what we've documented. And the same case to the developer and the same case to the user when they're doing the UATs uh, will also confirm that we follow the process. So what processes are unique in this system? Order creation process is not trivial because the order creation process needs to generate notifications. So that's why you are saying you create the order, you generate the order number, you save the order into the DB. Here it's not trivial because we say the order number has to be a number that you guys will come up with an algorithm that doesn't tell people how many orders we've created in the system. Then sending out notifications, if the customer has the MSISD, and remember an order is attached a type to a customer. So if customer X, we are creating an order for customer X, we check whether they have the number, or they have an email address set, if they do have, and then we go and check whether the Baker create template allows us to send SMS. Then we come and pick the SMS template and we send to that mobile number or send the email to that email address for that customer. So the same case to order status management, when you change an order from maybe confirmed to delivered, we have to check the template, confirm that we can send SMSs and emails, go pick the templates, replace with the current order details and send them out. Same case to payment processing and payment processing is actually more complex because you have to come and adjust the amount paid accordingly. We compute the amount paid is enough to, for order confirmation. We check whether the percentage deposit has been, uh, we have gone above that. If you've gone above that, then we change the order to be confirmed. If the order was 1500 and you paid 500 and the percentage deposit was 50%, so we still leave the orders not confirmed or active or new. Then once you come and make the second payment, the second payment may be 600, you move to 1100. Ah, then we discover the order has gone past 50%. At that particular point, we are supposed to change the status to confirm. 
And that's why you're saying if the total amount paid is higher than the deposit amount, then the order status is new. And the order status is new, then you change it to confirmed. If the order amount paid is the same as the order, then you know that the order has been fully paid. Otherwise, the order is partially paid and you send notifications for partial payments with the amount that is pending included. If you fully pay, then you send notifications for full payment without the pending amount included. Then, sorry, these ones, don't worry about it. This is misplaced. It's not supposed to be here. But that's, that's essentially what you're supposed to do. Then the other thing is order reminder process, which I've not defined. The architects of this system will tell us how do you know who to remind and what record requires a reminder. And that uh, responsibility requires us to define a process flow where we say every day there is a job that will be running on the system that will be scanning all the orders that are due two days from now and we inform the baker that those orders are due for two days from now. Maybe there is also another setting to run a scan of the orders that are not confirmed or that are, sorry, that are not uh, orders that are not uh, delivered or closed. And we scan through the system, we check all those orders and we check the order that is supposed to be delivered today. Then in the morning, early in the morning, we send an email to the baker or an SMS to the baker and tell them, please remember that Domi's cake is supposed to be delivered today at 10 a.m. in Utawala. So essentially that's how the process is supposed to work. Of course, we have not finished everything, but one of the things I wanted you guys to appreciate is the various elements that you need to think through as you define uh, and create your solution. You see, the process is the most important thing. If you apply this, it works and it has worked for us. We've created products for other people. We've created products for ourselves and they do work. And I believe that at the end of the next two weeks, this baked solution will actually be a product that will be working for some people. And we want you guys to apply the same. And at this particular point, I want to ask you guys to post the questions that you have regarding what we've discussed today. And I hope now you have an idea of process modeling. Process modeling tells the developers how to implement certain logics that we think are complex. The ones that are trivial, you don't need to tell a developer how to delete a record from the DB. It's too much documentation. Yeah. So we don't do that even for our own organization. Some things will become trivial such that even logging in, we won't mention how login is supposed to work and sign up because we assume that once you create one, you can always apply that knowledge and follow the standard of the development house that you're working for or you're working on. So I think that's it. Uh, and I want to stop there. And I hope the session was beneficial to someone. Molly. Shoot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can I can now share what I did. Yes. You can share your your screen and uh, you can show us. I know I have already shared the model, so I hope you don't uh, we can find something that we can include in your from your model. Okay. I I I've realized that there's so many things that I did not include, but this is what I have. Yeah. So <laughs> I have the customer model order. Like I just tried to uh, highlight the attributes in, in each model. So like in customer, I had the customer ID, I had the customer name, phone number, location. And then on the payment status, I was not sure but I, I was thinking that maybe uh, the customer when the customer is placing an order maybe a notification a notification goes to the to the baker that maybe it, it's paid though i'm not sure about it yet and then there's order id mm. um and then on the order model i have order id and then i have product name so i included the product as a model, so I have mm. a, 
I have order ID, I have product name, and then due date. So maybe mm. date when the, the order is supposed to be delivered. And then I have the product ID and the, the delivery status mm. of the order, whether it's delivered yeah, or not. Mm. And then I have the Baker model. I had the Baker ID, the Baker name. And then I had the customer ID to create the relationship. Yeah, between the Baker and the payment. <laughs> and then I had the order ID and then the mode of payment. Because we're talking about send money, uh, till or pay bill. So mode of payment. And then I have the payment model where I have the mode of payment. The customer name, uh, oh, this one is not supposed to be here. And then the customer ID, payment ID, Baker ID, and then the payment status. Yes, which will go to the Baker. <laughs> and then I have the, I have the notification model where mm. I have the customer ID, I have the product name, mm. um, I have the notification ID, order ID, and the event. If it's an anniversary or, or or birthday, yes. And then I have the feedback model where I have the customer ID and then the order status and then the comment whether the the product was as expected or did not meet the expectation of the customer. And then I try to create the relationship, which I know it's so perfect, but between the baker and the order, I have uh, one too many relationships. So a baker can re yeah, receive more than one order. And then I have uh, a relationship between the baker and the payment model. So yeah, one baker can receive multiple payments from different orders or customers. And then I have a relationship. Oh, I did not discuss the product model. Product model, I have product ID, product category. Uh, yeah, well, I was thinking that maybe if someone wants uh, the type of cake they want, mm. then I have the quantity. Yeah, and then I have the price of the products. And then maybe the description, if need be. <laughs> so I have a, mm -hmm, a relationship between the order and the and the product model okay. yes <laughs> yeah so that is so what you, uh, you've tried uh identifying the models and this is good progress but there is one general comment that i would make uh mm -hmm. regarding when we say modeling you have to think about the object and its attributes is that okay Yes. Objects and its attributes. Like a person, the age, or oh sorry, or oh, the date of birth. Mm -hmm. By design, you are not supposed to capture things that keep changing. So you capture the truths that don't change. So you capture the date of birth, and you capture the name, you capture the ID number. Yeah. So, so the, can you go up so that I challenge you without thinking? Uh, go there, and you have to ask yourself, is payment status an attribute of the customer? Payment status. When you create a, when you create a yeah. customer, like I could have a customer. So what's a payment status? It's not the property of a customer. Yeah, it's sure. the, the property of something else. I don't want to mention which object, but it's a property of something else. Uh, yeah. The phone yeah. number belongs to the customer. The address, Miyake. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the status is in the like we don't wake up and say maybe you can say the status of the customer assuming that you want the customer to have a state in the system okay but not the, the payment status would actually naturally be in the payment or in the order maybe to say whether the order has been paid or not are you yes. getting Yes. And the other thing is you have to think about first is objects and their natural attributes. Two, you have to really think about relationship, which I can see here we have some challenges. The baker, an order, is, is it attached to the baker? The order is actually attached to the customer. Because a customer can make three orders. True or not true? You can sure. make, make a cake order every week, yeah? 
Yeah, yeah. So, so the order ID, the customer ID is the one that goes to the customer, not the other way around. Because every order must belong to a customer. Okay. And every customer must belong to a baker in our model with the limitations that are most already identified. In future, our model will change totally. But you have to think of the natural relationships that a payment is pegged on an order. Unless you want people to pay for what? For honor. So payment in this case is pegged on an order and maybe something that we have to look at. So for now, uh, I can see here we have, we have to refine, you have to go through the model in a bit for you to appreciate it further. But it's good progress. Identifying the object is one thing, but relationships are very critical. A, a class can have many students. So you don't move the student ID to the class object. Maybe this doesn't make sense to you now, but you need to get to a point where it makes sense that if you have a class has many students, it is natural to put the student to have the class they belong to, not to go and put the, not to go and add a field in the class saying the student, unless you're telling us a class is for one student. I might not be making a lot of sense, but you need it, to it, dig deeper in. Yeah, it, it, it's, we need to dig deeper into those relationships. Designing and developing, we are not violating those things. Now, okay. if you get this thing wrong, no matter how good you are in writing code, it won't work. Whether you understand aspect-oriented programming, you are the multi-threading guru, it won't work. That's why we are focusing on the pro, on the process. Because you follow the right process, create the great experiences for the products. People would love what you're creating. Yes, this is way beyond one hour. Um, so I do not want to continue talking uh, more. But thank you, uh, Molly, for sharing this. Uh, I'm hoping that as we continue, we'll get to, to practice and practice more. Uh, and one day, you mm -hmm. will... You will look back and you'd say, you know what, uh, I can see the growth and I can see myself transitioning from a student to a problem solver.